Hello, and welcome to the Covenant of Mayors podcast, unlocking insights into how cities can adapt to climate change throughout Europe. I'm Anthony Coakley, and today I'll be speaking to Ion Sola Toralba, an environmental engineer and a PhD in remote sensing who has focused his professional and academic career on geographic information systems, which I'm afraid you'll sometimes hear in this podcast being referred to by the acronym GIS, or GIS. As a primary contributor to the European Life IP NADAP de CC project, Ion analyzes the effects of climate change in Spain's Nevada region, and to what extent countermeasures are effective against them. We may get a bit technical today, but we're both doing our best to keep it as human as possible. In part one of the podcast, we'll try to get a practical understanding of what geographic information systems are, and how they can answer questions about climate change in Nevada and beyond. In part two, we'll delve into the data to understand how to get monitoring right, why it's essential, and what tactics are actually working to mitigate the effects of climate change. Eo, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. So Ian, you're an expert in monitoring climate effects via this remote sensing and geographical information systems. Could you explain in easy to understand terms what these technologies are about? Yes, my friends used to ask me about my job and it's always a tricky question. I will give you first the official definition and then I will go for an easier way to describe it. A geographic information system is a system that creates, manages, analyzes and maps all types of data. This connects data to a map, integration, location data, where things are, with all types of descriptive information. And this provides a foundation for mapping and analysis that is used in science and almost every industry. This is the official <laughs> definition. But I will say that GIS is the a discipline that works with data with geographic information, something uh, as easy as that. And nowadays, that means every data which can be put on a map. It could be economic, social, environmental. I could give you plenty of examples. You could make a, a map of Kobe, the spread over the world, or charging points for electric cars, or dwelling in flooding areas, map of risks, vulnerability, hazards. It could be points, polygons, whatever. It could have temporal evolution. It has plenty of combinations. And more or less, the, the steps of IDIS are, the first step is always collecting data and managing data. We spend a lot of time playing with the data and putting the data in the right format and uh, filtering, subsetting data, and so on. The second step could be creating the, the map or, or an application, a web application, for example. So that means defining the, the symbology, configure the pop-ups or the site explanation. And then the last step is the, the analyzing itself describing the territorial distribution of the data, finding patterns or time series, looking for hot spots, clustering the data, grouping, and obviously establishing conclusions from the data. And remote sensing, it's like a little part of this world of GIS. It's mainly satellite data, and it's used to monitor physical characteristics of an area by measuring its reflected and emitted radiation from the satellite images. And this is a very valuable data source because it gives us the option to get information from the world, and from the study area, the region, whatever. And in the last years, the resolution is increasing. I mean, the, the pixels are, are smaller, so you, you have uh, more accurate information. Also, the temporal resolution, that means that the revisit time is slower. So maybe uh, you have one image uh, per day. And in, some years ago, we had one image per month. So it's a massive change. And also we have a better spectral resolution. So you can analyze not just the visible wavelengths, but also infrared and radar. And, and, and the applications are, are massive. We could say you could use remote sensing to estimate soil moisture or to make land use, land cover classification, to detect flooded areas using algorithms or burn areas by forest fires or to measure the degree of imperviousness of a region. Yet I could give you a lot of examples. So it's interesting because from what you're saying, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but geographical information systems then is actually just a complicated way of saying a map because also people who made the maps in the 1400s and earlier, they were using tools to develop information systems. So 
is that right to say that if you're a cartographer, a map maker, but using more types of information and not no longer the compass and the rope, but something more satellites and, and infrared? Yeah, you, you could say that, but in the last years, it's something a bit bigger than just maps because you can make a web applications, dashboard to analyze the data, to summarize it or show the, the graphs, the, the main statistics. This goes beyond the, the definition of a map. And also, we do have more information, much more information than in the past. You don't have to go for in situ measurements sometimes because you have the satellites, you have a lot of series of data, everything is measures. And now we are going for open data in a lot of countries. So data which were not available in the past or you have to pay for it or you have to go for different places to get the data. Now it's getting easier more automatized so you, you can use uh, scripts to to get the data from different folders which was something impossible maybe 30 years ago so okay I'll, i'm going to call it some uh, in my own mind like a, a hyper map or something like this <laughs> yeah yeah it, does. it sounds good i think as well people would be interested because you're talking about the types of information we can get from this monitoring and i was listening to something recently where they were talking about people working for oil markets and they're using satellite imagery or maybe sound systems to determine how much oil is going through pipes across mm -hmm. the world and they're using that to make financial decisions on the other side of the world when we look at Google Maps, for example, we see these quite low resolution, fuzzy images of our own house or something. But actually, the quantity of data you can extract just from this imagery is extraordinary, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. You have a plethora of applications, which is almost impossible to imagine. I just know a few of them, but it's, there are many of them. I'd love it if you could share from your years of working in this, both professionally and, and in an academic setting, some experience from your own life or work that has helped to motivate you in pursuing this, this topic? Okay, uh, before starting working here in the Subinsa company, I did the PhD, focus on remote sensing. And one of my passions in, in my personal life is the mountains. I like to go to the mountains for hiking, for trail running, skiing, climbing, whatever. And my thesis supervisor, she proposed in my PhD to research the topographic correction of satellite images. That means trying to correct the effects of shadows created by mountains in the satellite images, which make it difficult to get all unreliable information from these mountainous areas. And I said, okay, mountain, it, it sounds good. And it's more or less connected to my, to my passion. And in fact, I have to do a a research stay abroad, it was compulsory. So I decided to go to, to Bolzano in the in the north of Italy, which is very, very close to the Dolomites. So I was in the office analyzing the this mountainous area from the satellite. And then in the afternoon, I was going to the, to the same mountains just, to, just for hiking or, or trail running. So it was, it was very nice. Great, so a very modern man of the mountains. <laughs> yes. You're focusing in on the region of Nevada. Can you tell us a little bit about this region? What should people know about it? Yeah, I will obviously tell you about, about San Fermin, San Fermin Festival of Pamplona, which is the capital of Navarra. It's internationally famous festival from 7th to 14th of July. And it's mainly famous because of the bull running. I, I'm not a big fan myself, and I think it's a very dangerous activity. I just watch it on TV. But I recommend you to, to come and visit us these days because it's a great atmosphere and the cultural agenda is massive. And for the people who don't know Navarre, the thing for which it stands out the most is its diversity. In terms of landscape, in a relatively small region, just about 10,000 square kilometers, you can observe from dense beach and oak forest in the north to desert areas in the south in just 100 kilometers. So, yeah, also. Also, so socially, it's very heterogeneous from north to south, but especially in landscape. That's a good sales pitch for the area then. You're in the field of climate research, climate science. So is there anything particular about the climate in Nevada? Yes, as, as I told you before, it's very, very diverse. And also in terms of climate in Navarra, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean and the Alpine bio geographical regions converge. So the climatic variability runs through these extremes. And, and right now, the, the global warming is producing alterations in its distribution in latitude and, and altitude. And, and these changes are affecting the comfort conditions of plant species, animals, and human systems. 
So to, to give you some examples, uh, Navarra is not a coastal region. We, we don't have coast. But Enderlata uh, is a town in the north of Navarra, a very small town. It's just 10 kilometers apart from the sea. So obviously, the climate is strongly influenced by the sea. But we also have the western part of the Pyrenees between Spain and France. And the, the highest point is the Mesa de los Tres Reyes, or Three Kings Table, is the name of the mountain. And it has 2,400 meters, and it's characterized by an alpine line landscape. And on the contrary, in the southern part, we have mainly plain and less vegetated area, more characterized by Mediterranean climate, more drier, I mean. So it sounds like a little bit of a nightmare for someone whose job is to monitor all of the different climactic effects and their interrelation. Yeah, it's good for our job. It's not as good for the region, but we, we can analyze all the hazards derived by the climate change, except the, maybe the coastal erosion or the sea level. So you're working in this project, Life and Adapter. I guess that's Navarra and Adapt stuck together. Exactly. <laughs> So it kind of speaks for itself, but maybe you could tell us a bit about the project you're engaged in and the work that you're doing in particular. Okay, Life and Adapta project is an integrated strategy for the adaptation to climate change of a region, in this case Navarre. And it's an eight years duration project from 2017 to 2025. So we are in, now in the last part of the, of the project, last year's. And it's an integrated project led by the government of Navarra, of Navarra. And, and it also, it's also a part of Navarra's climate change roadmap called CLINA, which includes mitigation and adaptation. So the adaptation part, this roadmap, comes from an ADAPTA project. And the project seeks to anticipate the changes that may occur through the development of adaptation measures that limit the negative effects derived from these changes and as far as possible, take advantages of the positive impact, because not all, all the impacts of climate change are negative, also there are the positive local impacts. And these early and well-planned adaptation measures will ensure a better future and economic saving, and theoretically, if they are successful, they could be replicated in other regions of Europe or the world. And just to give you a general idea of the project, this adaptation measures and the project itself is structured in six different areas. Monitoring, forest, water, agriculture and livestock, health and infrastructures and territorial planning. Uh, as it covers different areas of study, not only the government of Navarra is involved, but also several affiliated companies like Nils, Sagan, Intia, Upna, and Nasubinsa, which is my company. In, in my company, we are involved in two of these areas, in monitoring, which is more or less knowing the real data on climate change in Navarra and its evolution in order to be less vulnerable, and also in infrastructures and territorial planning and the mainly focus on promoting energy regeneration of the urban and rural environment and analyzing the vulnerability of, of infrastructures and landscapes. And, and my particular role in the project is just in the monitoring part. And uh, one of the goals was creating a monitoring tool, monitoring system for the effects of climate change in Navarra and also for the implemented adaptation measures on the other hand. So we wanted to know what's going on with the climate change and what we are doing to adapt to these effects. And so you're using this remote sensing stuff and the geographical information systems. And maybe we could speak about them separately. So first of all, when it comes to remote sensing technologies, what technologies are you bringing to bear on this space? This project is a big project, but we don't have time for searching. I mean, we have to go for products which are unended. So we are using data from Copernicus program, which is a program of the European Union, and they have data. So for example, they, they have uh, maps of, of Europe for imperviousness degree. Uh, so th this, this is, for example, a good example of remote sensing because we can get the, the map of each municipality of Navarra uh, from this data source. And uh, every three years, they, they update it. So you, you get from 2006 to 2021, uh, we have 15 years with data. And you can check if the imperviousness of your municipality is going higher or lower. 
which is a good adaptation measure because if we want to adapt to, for example, the floating risk, uh, the lower is the imperviousness, the better. I mean, if you replace a concrete a square by a green area, then this green area will get a lot of water and this will be better in a flooding event. So instead of just doing in situ measurements to say, okay, I did a park here, I did this there, you get the information just from the satellite and you can compare one year with, the, with another. That, that could be a, a good example. Imperviousness is to do with water. How much water can be soaked into the area? Is that right? Yes, yes. I know the term in Spanish, but I think the term in English is that one. It, it means the percentage of imperviousness means how much water can get the, the soil. So if it's a concrete, it will be 0%. And if it's a green area, close to 100, something like that. So you're not actually putting in your own technologies, but you're using data sets that have been generated in, in other ways. Is that right? So one of them is the satellite data from Copernicus on water permeability. Are there other sets of data that you're bringing to bear on the space? Yeah, we wanted to use also satellite data for forest fires, for for burning burning area, and also for flooding flooding area. But it's very difficult because you need to do it for every flooding event which happens in, in a bar or every forest fire. And sometimes we do have problems with, with the clouds. So if you have clouds, you don't get the, the information. So instead of that, we are using this with the barn area, which are defined by the Spanish government. I mean, more or less, the, the GIS has two kinds of data, the raster data, which are images, and the vectorial data, which could be a point, polygons, or lines. And we try to combine both. In this case, for example, in the barn area, we have a database which shows the barn area per year and per municipality for Spain. So you can analyze which municipality is more affected by forest fires, and you can also assess the temporal evolution of this burned area, which is an impact of climate change. But in the end, this is not remote sensing. This is more, more vectorial information. Okay, so your PhD was dealing with shadows, and maybe a PhD for someone in the future is going to be dealing with clouds. <laughs> yes, yes. If you use, for example, radar information, they are not affected by the clouds because the signal can penetrate the clouds but if you are working with let's say optical images then yes you have to look for cloud free images and if you are working it depends on the application you can get like a composite which is a like a mix of different images from different days but when you need a specific day just to check the burn area or the flooding area then it's difficult to replace this this cloudy image by, by an image of another day. So you're looking at forest fires based on the data that the municipalities are able to provide, the flood risk or permeability based on these images from Copernicus. What are some other types of data that you're taking in? Well, I could give you a lot of examples because we have like, I think, 114 indicators right now in the website. I invite you to to go and, and dig a little bit because it's very visual. The, the website is monitoring.lifeandadapta.eu. And for example, in terms of climate, we are monitoring the total monthly and annual precipitation, the maximum precipitation in one day, in one hour, or in five days, the number of consecutive dry days, the average maximum temperature, so you can for, for each indicator, you can you get a dashboard with the map. We are analyzing different meteorological stations. You can get the trend of the last 60 years. You get information to what extent we are getting higher temperatures or changes in the precipitation patterns. Also for, for water, in the water sector, we are monitoring the number of dwellings located at ground level in flooding areas, also the damage to property caused by flooding, which is a data from the insurance companies. They, they give us for each sector and each municipality all the damage in, in economic, in, in euros, I mean. Also, as an adaptation measure, it, it, we, could, we are monitoring the number of municipalities with self-protection plans against flooding. 
this this is for example a, a very very easy easy data because it's just yes or no yeah for a map of the municipalities we have also indicators for hydrological drought status and for forest for example i will give you just two because there are many of them the annual hectares burned by forest fires, we were talking before, the level of defoliation per species, and also for different agents, which are causing this defoliation. Uh, these are in situ measurements. This is part of a European network with different plots. And there are people from the government of Navarra going there every year, analyzing tree by tree the defoliation degree. And we just put all this data together of every week and every year they are collecting. And we try to make an easy and appealing visualization where you can get conclusions from the time evolution. Also in, in agriculture, we are measuring the, the water consumption for different crops, uh, which is related to adaptation measures to reduce the water consumption. The number of alerts for emerging pest infestation, the variations in yield of main crops. And for health, for example, we are analyzing the mortality attributable to temperature species and also vulnerability indicators, just like the poverty risk rate or the number of people over the age of 80 who live alone, which are people who are more vulnerable for most of the hazards derived from climate change. And these are some, some examples, but we have many. So you're thousands of miles up looking at the spread of, for example, temperature or fire over the region, but then you also know how many leaves are on the tree and how many insects are crawling up the bark. And I mean, you have incredible depth. Yeah, the, this, this last example, it's partial information because we have only a few plots. So in contrast to the this remote sensing data where you are analyzing the the whole region. In this case, you have just like 10 plots with different tree species. And yeah, they are more or less rep representative of the, of the main species in Navarra, but we have just a few of them. I think basically everything that you've mentioned so far, it's quantitative data. Are you also taking in any qualitative metrics as part of the project? Well, yes and no. We, we did, for example, vulnerability and risk assessment but it was based on quantitative data mainly. It was like a synthetic indicator based on different indicators with different weights. So we were measuring how vulnerable was a municipality according to a set of maybe 20 or 30 indicators. So in the end, yes, we were categorizing this vulnerability in low, medium or high. Uh, now and also in the future, according to the climate projections, but this, this qualitative information was based on quantitative data. If we have data, we try to, to do it quantitatively. Can you talk at all about your findings so far from all these sensors? Yes, it's difficult. I mean, uh, the, the, the easier thing is the, the temperature. Like in any other region of, of the world, uh, we are uh, uh, noticing a, a great increase of the temperature. And this increase is is getting faster in the last years. So if you analyze, if you compare the period, the reference period of 1961 to 1990, if you compare to the actual period from the current period from 91 to 2020, you get an increase of temperature, which could be 0. 25 degrees per year. Saying like that, it sounds like not that much, but it's quite a lot and the impacts are, are dramatic. And but if you if you check for for the last years, this this increase is, is going faster. So and this happens in, in every area, every analyzed area, in every meteorological station. Uh, if you go for pre precipitation, it's not that clear. It depends on the area. There are areas where the path, the, the trend is a little decrease in annual precipitation, but in other in other areas there is an increase or it's more or less stable. But we focus more on the changes in the pattern. So what the what other studies say is that we are getting more frequent and intense heavy rain events, and this means more floodings. But this, we, we can see this in some of the data of Navarra, but, but not in all of them. I mean, it's not that clear as, as in 
as in temperature. About the impact, yes, if, if you go for the for the damages caused by floods, they are increasing quite quite a lot. The the barn area also shows a little increase, but not not as big as expected because there are a lot of changes from one year to another. Maybe one year you have a, a big forest fire, which affects, for example, this last summer was was very bad in Navarra with a lot of forest fires. But or maybe maybe the next year we are lucky and we we don't have any big forest fire. So also there is an increase. In in the number of health problems related to heat waves and also in the number and frequency and intensity of heat waves and also about drought this is not so clear for example we are monitoring the number of consecutive dry days with no precipitation and these these periods are getting longer in some areas but they are getting uh, a bit uh, smaller in, in others. Are you still with us? Despite his technical background, I think Eon's done a great job so far breaking down his work so that we can understand it. He's touched on the challenges facing Nevada, this region with such diverse geography and climate, and how mapping helps to answer questions about the effects of climate change, like flooding, rainfall, and forest fires. We've got some insights into the vast array of data that the team has access to, and how they can see the bigger picture by putting it all together. But I'm still left with questions. Some of the data sets he's referred to seem quite restricted. I'd like to know how solid the conclusions that we can draw from such data really are. I also want to know more about not just what monitoring has told him about climate change, but also about the success or failure of our attempts to fight against it. I caught him mentioning earlier how some of the effects of climate change can be positive ones, which I'm definitely curious to understand better, and I'm also planning to try to provoke him a little by asking if the kind of monitoring he's doing is really necessary at all. After all, we know the Earth is getting hotter, and we already know how to stop it, right? Stick with us for part two. talked about having data from the 60s and then also data from the from what was it 2009 or something in Copernicus is your is your data set is the timeline long enough to draw meaningful conclusions how much can you establish with certainty on the basis of your findings or how long will it be until say you're able to develop that certainty yeah that's a very good question and that's one of the main challenges of of this project in in terms of climate data, we are very lucky because we have a very long time series. In some of the meteorological stations are 100 years uh, long because they started in yeah, about uh, 1920 or something. And we have a lot of reliable information and we are also working with climatic projections for different scenarios. So, so that's good. In other kind of data, we only have a series of three, four, five, six years. So we have to be very careful with the con conclusions. I mean, I think it's always good to, to have more data and more knowledge and to show it to the, not just the policymakers, but also the general public. But when you have a, a series of three, four, five years, it's very difficult to, to establish conclusions. You cannot, if you have a, an increasing trend in four years, this is not statistically significant. And also, uh, probably the climate change in most of the cases is not, it's just a catalyst. But the, the indicator and the, and the impact is, is caused by different, different causes. So, yeah, that's, that's difficult. As you mentioned already, a, a lot of the data that you're working with is already available in different sources and from different origins. So I think a lot of the value, as I understand it, a lot of the value of what you're doing is putting all of these different types and areas of data together into a kind of coherent whole. So can you tell me about the picture that emerges for you when you see all of this data coming together in the project that you're running? Hmm. Yes, the, the monitoring of climate change is, is affecting different sectors, so, so, and we are not experts of all of them. So we start doing meetings with the responsible people of each sector to define these indicators, and they, they give us ideas about the, the data sources and how to calculate it. 
So, so yes, in most of the cases, as you say, the, the data are available. But for example, in some cases, for example, the, the pollen, which is something affecting the people with allergies, and it could be tied by the climate change, not just the concentration of different actions, but also the, the period of the year when this concentration peaks appear. And in the government of Navarre, they are working with this data for a long time and they are publishing reports every month. And also they show real data and the forecast, which is very useful for, for people suffering allergies. But if you want to get the full picture of the, this long series, you have to go for this PDF of monthly reports and you, you have to put all of this together. So we are trying to get all this PDF, create a, a database with all the data together. Then this goes to the, to the web and this, then we create the, the map and some appealing visualization. This is more or less the, the methodology. We're all aware that climate change is a global crisis and something that we have to deal with. You mentioned before some medium-term positive effects that people might see from it. Can you tell me about positive effects you're seeing in your measures? Well, if, if you go for the yield of crops, in, in some cases, I mean, the productivity, in some cases, it could be increased. And what we know is that some crops are showing, are moving north. For example, the vine yards, if, if you get the area where the vine yards were 30 years ago and right now, they are slowly going going north because the climate is, is changing. That means it could have negative effects in, in the southern area, but it could have positive effects in the in the north. A colleague says all gives always the example of the wine. There is wine which is now not so good in the in France because it's suffering the climate change, but maybe in the UK you are getting better options to, to have good wine because of the climate. It could be a, a positive impact. Great. Well, I mean, if it's good for the global north and bad for the global south, then it's just as normal, right? I mean, what if the problem <laughs> <laughs> but, that... but it's it But I, I think there are m much more uh, negative impacts than positive ones, <laughs> unfortunately. Sure, sure. So... You're not just measuring the effects of climate change, you're also measuring the effectiveness of measures that are supposed to try and counteract, uh, mitigate or adapt to climate change. Could you tell us concretely about such a measure and how this assessment works? Okay, uh, yes. We, uh, th this monitoring tool is based on, on four objectives, just to, to try to, to explain everything. So we are trying first, the first objective is characterizing the hazard. This means the cl climatic variables to see the trends in, in Navarra. Then we try to characterize the exposure and vulnerability for different hazards. I, I gave you some examples of vulnerability, but there are plenty of them. Then we monitor the impact, uh, like the, the burn area or the damages of the, or the mortality, caused by temperature excesses and so on. And the last objective is implementing adaptation measures and monitoring them, what we are doing to adapt. And this is one of the main objectives of Life Adapta project itself. And, and one of the goals of the project is the dissemination of, of its benefits to promote its replication out of the project. And in some cases, the effectiveness of the adaptation measure is estimated. But, but this is a, a great challenge and it's not always achievable. And I give you an example. One of the hazards of climate change, according to both observed and projected data, is the increase in the frequency and intensity of heavy rainfall events, which could negatively affect the sewage systems. And the implementation of a sustainable urban drainage system shows its advantages and viability for urban runoff rainwater management. And it reduced pollution load and allowing run of water to filtrate in the in the substrate and thus protecting the sewage system. This is an action of the project and in the monitoring tool we are including a dashboard with all the implemented sustainable urban drainage system of Navarra uh, together with their characteristics. This is a good example of a successful replication of a specific adaptation measures measure of the project. I mean, it, there was a pilot in the public university of Navarre, which was an action of the project, 
but then other municipalities, other responsibles are doing this adaptation measure, are replicating it in other areas of Navarra. In this case, we cannot assess the effectiveness of all of them. But this pilot, this, in this pilot, they, they did it. They, they were using sensors to measure the water, the volume of water, which was to say, filtrated by the, by the system. And to what extent was reduced the risk of flooding in, in, in real flooding events. So they were assessing how effective was this, this system and also analyzing the reducing in the, in the pollutant concentration for different pollutants. So this is a, a good case, but as I told you, in, in most of the cases, it's very difficult and you can just get estimations because you, you cannot put sensors in every measure you, you make. What, what is a sustainable ur urban drainage system? How is that different from a normal drainage system? For example, in this one in the public University of Navarre is below a parking. So it, it has a kind of deposit, but with a lot of little stones. So it filters the, the water, it has a great capacity. And when it's a flooding event, instead of going just to the sanitation system, for example, it has more capacity to storage this, this water and to filtrate. But it depends on the material they use. And it, there is a lot, a lot of technology behind. And this is not something which is been doing in Navarra, but it's doing in a lot of regions because it it has a lot of benefits in terms of reducing the risk of, of flooding. You spoke to the difficulties. We, we know how much trouble scientists are having isolating the effect of red wine. Is it good for you or is it bad <laughs> for you? I mean, when you take just one input, say, and then you try to discover its effect, I know it can be really, really difficult. So can you tell me a little bit more maybe about the challenge of t t trying to monitor the success of any particular mitigation measure and ways of overcoming it? Yeah, the challenge is not only measuring the effectiveness of the measures, but in general monitoring the adaptation of climate change in the mitigation of climate change. I mean, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, there is a long way of monitoring. And in this, in this case, the, the difficult thing is to reach the, the goals, but the monitoring is very easy. I mean, you, you have to control the, to monitor the emissions for different sectors. And then if you want to reduce the emissions of transport, you need to look at the mobility behavior, you need to go for the public transport, the walking, the train, and so on. I mean, it, it's easier to monitor, even if it's hard to make it real. But in adaptation, it's more ambiguous. I mean, how, how well are we doing in adaptation? It's, in sometimes it's very difficult and the great challenge for me is trying to know to what extent the climate change affects its impact. This is a, something which which is told by many people here when we show the monitoring tool. They, they think it's impressive, they think it's very visual, they think it's a, a good tool to get more reliable information, but they say, okay, this is not just climate change. You are showing the barn area, but uh, this could be caused, but not climatic causes. And, and this, this, this is true for, for every indicator. This is for me the, the main challenge. This and also dealing with different formats, but this is more a, a technical challenge. So I could look at the data and say, well, are the adaptation measures becoming successful or is climate change just slowing down? Or <laughs> it's hard to... Um, exactly, what you, exactly. What do you do to try and to mitigate these difficulties or to, to overcome them? I mean, I know they can't be completely overcome, but, but how do you... How do you manage to make the case more cohesive? Well, if you go for other initiatives about monitoring adaptation, in many cases, they, they put them together with not a, not very a structure. It's like a geo portal with all the data and you can go for the one you're interested. In this case, we try to make a structure based on impact change, which is an IPCC um, concept. And we try to follow these four main goals I told you before. And at least we connect the different indicators and we have a narrative. I mean, if you go for the, for the flooding, you first get the climatic information. You know if it's raining more or less, if we have more frequent heavy rain events and so on. 
Then you analyze the exposure. You, you can see if you have more, more buildings, more dwellings in flooding areas or less, if, if they are more vulnerable or not, because we are analyzing both the buildings, how old they are or, the, or if they need to be restored. But also we analyze the social vulnerability. Then we monitor the impact. I mean, not, not just if they are vulnerable or exposed, but also when this impact happens, what are the effects? And then we try to show the different adaptation measures. So sometimes, it's, as you said, if you have a good trend in the impact, you, it's difficult to know if this, this is because you are very effective in your measures and this is because the, the hazard was decreased or it could have other causes. But at least we have to make a structure so the, the, the reader policymaker or, or uh, the general public can get the information together. And then indeed your tool makes it easier to comprehend and also the data is then also available for, for example, meta-analysis that wants to take in, into account other regions. Can you tell me what advice would you offer to cities that are trying to do what you're doing? So assessing the impact of climate change measures. Well, I think we are not doing enough, not in Navarra, not in Spain, anywhere. I think we have to go to go faster and we have to to mitigate, we have to adapt. I mean, it's not just climate change, it's also the energetic crisis we are dealing with right now. And yeah, I think it's good to have uh, a knowledge of the situation, just like a starting point. Uh, you can make the vulnerability assessment, the risk assessment, we are we are doing it. You can analyze the climate climatic data, but the, the main part is uh, you have to put money on the on the adaptation measures, on the mitigation measures. And, and yes, especially in mitigation, you need to analyze the effectiveness of the measures. I mean, it's not just saying, oh, we, I will buy 10 electric cars and I will put a low consumption lights in my, in my municipality, but then I need to check if I'm reducing effectively these, these greenhouse gas emissions. I need to check as far as possible if I'm adapting well to this increasing temperature and this impact of the climate change. I, and to counter that, I mean, I might say I'm a, as a municipality, you know, well, but I can tell you, and you're monitoring temperature rise. Well, we already know temperature is going up. You know, you, I'm putting in LEDs. Well, I can tell you already that LEDs take less power and therefore they're going to create fewer emissions. So why should I? Why should I monitor when it's it's logically evident that the, 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 my measures are going to be effective? Well, sometimes you say you are going to do something and you don't do it in the end, or it, or maybe you you think it's evident that you are your measures are going to be effective, but they are not as effective as you were expecting. It's it's always good. I mean, for example, in, in the Covenant of Majors, which is also part of Life Nafta project, because we are assessing the the Covenant of Mayors in Navarre for different municipalities. We want to to create a managing tool to to see what are they doing each municipality at the municipal level in terms of just not adaptation but also mitigation and energy poverty. And each measure has a estimated reduction of, the, of emissions and the consumption and so on. But, but then the best thing we can do, I think, is we have the, the ba baseline with the inventory of greenhouse gas emissions per municipality in 2019 when this started. If we do this again in, in four or five years, we will, we will assess if the municipalities are reducing these emissions to the extent they say they were doing. I mean, maybe you say you are reducing the 40% uh, doing these measures, and then you analyze four years later, and instead of 40, it's 25. I mean, it's not, it's not bad. We are doing our best, and we will try to reach the goals, but it's, it's difficult. We are seeing also in, at the country level, it's very, very difficult to, to arrive to these goals because it needs a lot of changes, and systemic changes are always low. And so it's a way of testing your efficacy and also maybe holding yourself to account. 
the tool that you've developed, is it available for people to use in other places or is it a Navara only? Company? No, no, no. The, the project itself, it was, it was born to be replicated. It was the first live integrated project focused just on adaptation of climate change for a region. And it has a lot of pilot. It has 40, 53 actions and a lot of pilot. And the idea is that if they are successful, they will be replicated. They are being replicated in other areas of Navarra, and they could be replicated if they are not now in many other regions. And and also the monitoring tool itself also could be. I mean, we were influenced by other initiatives before to make our tool. And we hope our tool could be helpful for others if they work in monitoring of climate change. I mean, the, the mo most of the impacts are, are common for, for every region, except the, the coastal erosion and the sea level rise, which is also only for the coastal regions. And it, it's a matter of, of making priorities. I mean, if you analyze your region, maybe you are more concerned about forest fires and in another region, they are more, more concerned about the certification, for example. And they have to go for this when they propose the adaptation measures. But in general, I think it's, it's very replicable. So, so other interested cities can reach out to your team and maybe develop similar tools on the basis of what you've done. I'd just like to finish with a question of maybe bringing you down to the personal level again. You're living in Nevada now, right? I remember someone speaking about the psychological effect of the um, Eiffel Tower in Paris, where the first time people were seeing the world like a map, you know? And then, of course, we all know about the, the psychological effect of the moon landing and these images of Earth from above. What is it like for you personally, as someone who has both the normal human view in the city and in the region, and also this God's eye view that takes in so much data that most people could never be aware of. And not just data, but I mean, you're thinking about 80 year olds who may be dying of heart failure and fires that are burning. Could you tell me about your experience on these two levels a bit and then we finish there? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in, as, as a citizen, I, I'm a bit uh, pessimistic about the situation. I'm, I'm very concerned about about dealing with this climate change. We are we are facing it, and I mean, as as everyone, I read the the media and the bad news, and it's I mean, it's as I said, I'm a bit pessimistic and sad. But as a professional, yeah, I'm very happy because I'm trying to help at least a little bit and I, I'm passionate of working with data and especially working with data for environment topics and yes we are working not not just in life and adapter but we are working also in projects related to energy transition waste management also a trade of goods services knowledge and capital from different regions and we are trying to help the government of Navarra in their strategies and plans and the monitoring of these plans and yes I I don't think it's like being a god with all this data together but yes I mean it's good to have access to all this and if we can make it accessible to everyone that that's a good starting point so the god's eye view is open to all <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, Ion, thank you so much for joining me today and for all this interesting info. And I'll forward, if people who are interested can go ahead to the website and, and see this tool that you're developing, which is a really fascinating one. So, so thanks a lot, and I hope you have a great day. Okay, thank you so much. I hope you like it. And thanks to all of you for joining us for another episode of the Covenant of Mayors podcast. I hope you managed to follow all the technical ideas and that we made them human enough for you. We're always interested in hearing feedback from the show. So if you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so via anthony.coakley at eurocities.eu. That's A-N-T-H-O-N-Y C-O-L-C-L-O-U-G-H at E-U-R-O-C-I-T-I-E-S dot E-U. And to discover more about Eon's project, you can go to monitoring.lifeandadapta.com EU. Oh, and remember you can find the full transcript of this episode on the Covenant of Mayors website. See you next time.